Thanks for checking out the weekly sermon from Church of the Resurrection. I pray that God will use this message to speak to you and help you grow in your faith journey. If you're in the KC area, I'd like to invite you to join us next week at one of our services or join us in live worship online at core.org worship. Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. To learn more about the service times in our ministries, please visit core.org. Hope you enjoy this week's message. I'm Penny Elwood, Blue Springs campus pastor. And our passage today is, the sec- is from the second chapter of the book of Acts. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. I don't know what you're feeling when you watch those images come across the screen, but they just rip my heart out. (laughs) And I hope they affect you too. I hope that together we look at this and say, there is something terribly wrong in the human condition, in, in our country, in each of these scenes, and that we want to be a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Today, we're going to ponder these scenes that have filled the internet over the last four weeks, and we're going to be asking questions about why is it this way? Why are we this way? And what would Jesus say to us, and what are we going to do from this point forward? The scenes of the fires in Minneapolis on Thursday night this week, the destruction and the divisions, you've, you've seen them in the video. These scenes are reminding me of something that we have uh, seen and experienced and heard many times before. In fact, in the 30 years that I've been the pastor here at Church of the Resurrection, there have been multiple occasions where we have seen this kind of uh, protest that turns into riot, that turns into violence, and and often flames. And, And in the midst of that, I'm always reminded of Langston Hughes' famous poem, Harlem. He writes these words, What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester? like a sore, and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over, like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? Thursday night it exploded in Louisville, Kentucky, regarding the death of 26-year-old Breonna Taylor, and in Minneapolis, in protest of the death of George Floyd. Both of these, of course, are symptoms Symptoms of a deeper problem, and the videos and deaths that we've seen are expressions of that deeper problem, an illness that affects us all. These videos, in some sense, are a mirror held up to our collective soul as, as Americans, as human beings, right? To, to understand, okay, these are things that actually happen, and usually we don't see them. In, in, in the community that I live in, I, I don't see these things very often. They don't happen to me or to people like me. And so for a moment, we have a chance to look and see these are things that some people experience on a routine basis. Again, in this message, we're going to try to understand the problem. We're going to ask what Jesus would say to us, and then we're going to turn to the Holy Spirit's work in our lives as we remember that this is the day of Pentecost. Let's talk about the problem within. 
So we're all created in the image of God. The Bible begins this way, God made Adam and Eve, and so there's only one couple to begin with in this wonderful archetypal story. And In chapter one of Genesis, chapter two and three, once more we find God makes the man of the dust of the earth and takes from his side a rib and makes the woman. And so we find there was just one original couple, right? And science seems to point to the fact that maybe we had one original set of, of ancestors and, and then we all emerge from them. We all come forth from them so that we are all family. And then when the Bible gets to Genesis chapter six and Noah and the ark and the flood covers the earth and once more, everything starts over again from this one family. We are human beings of the same race. We are God's children. And as we learned when we were children, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. And yet each of us carries with us a certain set of biases uh, there's not a one of us who doesn't have this. Solzhenitsyn once said that the, that the, you know, the line that, that divides good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. We all have these biases. And, and, and you know, we might have some good biases. We might have some good prejudices about people, prejudgments about people. People most like us, people who are our friends or live in our neighborhood or go to our schools. But, but then we have all of these biases about people who are different from us. And we don't even know where they came from. Like, like you know, they, they were learned when we were children. They were tapes that were played. Maybe our parents didn't even know where they came from. They didn't even, even intentionally give us these biases. They just happened to be what we learned. I mean, I grew up in Prairie Village in, a, in an elementary school where there wasn't a single person that I know of when I was a kid growing up there who was a person of color. And only a couple of people who weren't, you know, nominally Christian at least. And so what I learned is those, those other people lived somewhere else and they were different from us and maybe I should be a little bit afraid of them. I don't know that my parents ever told me that. In fact, I suspect they never would have said that. But it was a bias that I learned somewhere along the way. We have lots of biases and it's not just about race. When we talk about biases related to race, we call that racism, but there's a whole lot of other biases that we have. So when I think about my biases, I, I think about, and really all of our biases, some, some of those were things that we learned that were differences socioeconomically. We have certain ideas about the really rich people and what they must be like, or the really poor people and what they must be like. Or we think of liberals or conservatives, and I wonder, you know, when I say the word liberal, what does that mean to you? Is it a positive or a negative? When I say the word conservative, what does that mean to you? Something positive or something negative? When we think of people of other religions, what what do we think of them? What's the immediate feelings that we have in our minds or our hearts? And sometimes they're very positive, and sometimes maybe not after 9-11. You know, anyone who looked different from us that looked like they might have come from the Middle East, even though Americans couldn't differentiate between a Hindu and a Muslim at that time, many of them couldn't, you know, but they were all somehow, they were all responsible for the horrible things that happened. There were biases that, that we felt, you know, the fear of somebody who was different from us, and they were really confirmed, and one act by one small segment of one particular sect, and yet suddenly we had biases, you know, that were exploding, our fears that were exploding inside about a whole bunch of people from other religions. When we talk about people who live in the Deep South, what do you think? If you live in the Deep South, that sounds pretty good. But if you live in the Northeast, that may be, you know, there may be some biases you have. Or if you live in the Deep South and you think about people who live in the Northeast, if they live in New York City or maybe they live in Los Angeles, what do you think about those people? And Trump supporters, do you have any ideas about Trump supporters? Any biases, anything that immediately comes to mind? Maybe that's your group. And yet maybe for others, you know, not so much. Or Biden, or Hillary Clinton, when we even say those names, certain things, certain feelings begin to emerge for some people. These are all of our biases. This, this last week, I was reading conspiracy theories on both the left and the right, and it's interesting how many conspiracy theories are just running rampant right now on the internet, and, and, and people begin to believe these things, and sometimes they even you know, begin to act upon these things, and so depending on whether you're on the left or the right, the opposite side is the Antichrist or is, you know, or is demonized, and, and then somewhere, if you actually believe that they're as dangerous as you think they, you know, as you've been taught that they are, Sometimes people get guns and they begin to act. People die sometimes based upon our biases. Now, most of us would not consciously claim to be prejudiced against any group. No one wants to be thought of, particularly as a racist. We don't want to be thought of as one of those kind of people, and so we would all disavow that. And yet we all have biases. We all have these things deep inside that we have to deal with. Our fears, our prejudices, the things that were shaped by our childhood, our parents, maybe the news networks that we listen to or the voices we allow into our heads, our friends, our teachers, and our life experiences. This is true in each of us. Most of these biases are inaccurate. Generalizations that we make, assumptions, uh, they color how we see the world around us but as we actually get to know people, we find out it really doesn't work that way. They, they, it isn't like everybody in that particular group is like this. We know this with our head, but sometimes we forget it. 
our biases color how we interpret the data that we see. So we're always interpreting, whether you're a news reporter or, or, or you're just an ordinary Joe or Jane, you're watching what happens and you're interpreting it. You're giving meaning to it. And when you're giving meaning to it, that's often shaped by our biases. Now, biases are not as big of an issue if you're a person in power, if you're in privilege, that is if you are the dominant population or if you're the population that has the most power, wealth, resources, education, whatever it might be, the most members of Congress. Like, you don't worry so much about bias. But if you're on the underside of that, you know, if you're one of those people who don't have power, bias can get you killed. It's what led three guys in Brunswick, Georgia to see a young man, a young black man, jogging through a white neighborhood on a Sunday afternoon and knowing there had been crimes reported a couple of months earlier and one person had lost a you know, gun had been taken from his car. He didn't see who took the gun from his car, but here's a young black man jogging through a white neighborhood and the biases say, this is probably the guy. Maybe we should get him. Right, and two of them load up their guns and begin tracking him down. I don't suspect that they plan to kill him that day. They plan to scare him, maybe get him arrested. But they ended up killing him. And another guy filmed it. So he had a record of it, of what they had done. It was, uh, it was this that led, this kind of bias that led uh, a neighborhood, an upper middle income neighborhood in Edmond, Oklahoma, in a suburb much like Johnson County, uh, many of our neighborhoods in Johnson County. And, and uh, there's a man named Travis Miller who's delivering goods to a house in this neighborhood. You need a code to get into the neighborhood and drive, you know, enters the code and he drives his, you know, JB, he works for JB Hunt. He's got his uniform on, he's driving a JB Hunt truck and he delivers whatever he had to deliver and then he's leaving and one of the leaders of the HOA blocks him in with his car and, and demands to know who he was delivering to or how he got the code or what he was doing in the neighborhood. And for 30 minutes, there's a standoff there. And this big giant of a man, African-American, he's sitting there, he keeps his seatbelt on because he knows if he gets out, he might get in trouble, he might get hurt. Right? And, and you hear, he records the whole thing, not knowing what's going to happen. He records the whole thing, and you, know, you, you see his anger and his frustration and the, and the hurt in that, and, and you know, the, the, you know, all of the feelings that I, I was finding myself feeling as I watched the 37-minute version of it. And then, and then finally, you get to the end where, where the homeowner he delivered things to told the HOA fellow, you know, I know he was really delivering for me, and he finally pulls away, and the HOA guy does, and he calls the police, said, hey, you don't need to worry about coming. And, and, then, and then the guy's sitting there in his car, his partner next to him, and he just starts to break down. I mean, this is, this is what it felt like in that moment. Take a look. That's crazy. I don't know. Yeah. There's too much going on mentally. That's what bias looks like and what it does. We learn these biases. And one of the only ways we can unlearn many of them is to actually get to know people who are different from ourselves, to spend time with somebody who's of the opposite political party and actually befriend them, or somebody who's in a different state, or somebody who's of a different religion, or somebody who's of a different race, and take the time to hear their stories, listen to their pain, empathize with them, understand and experience what they're going through and not dismiss it. If you're the person in power, the person with a voice, it comes from listening to those who don't have a voice or whose voices are often drowned out or not heard, who sit in a truck for 37 minutes afraid of what might happen if they try to pull away. For 29 years, we've said that part of our mission was to break down the walls of racial division in our city. Uh, we've had teams, task forces, we've had programs and, and projects that we've worked on. We've learned in the course of those 29 years that there is no you know, magic solution that can fix racial divides in a city. And we are the 13th, last time I checked, the 13th most racially segregated major American city. I mean, we live in our sections and our areas with people who are like us most often. But the one thing we found is that relationships have the possibility of changing us. They change our biases. When suddenly I'm in relationship, I'm breaking bread with you, I'm hearing your stories, I see things differently than I ever saw them before. Which is why several years ago, we formed an organization called Allies for Racial Justice with St. James United Methodist Church here in Kansas City, uh, the largest predominantly African-American church in our church. And, and so we have teams, and you can sign up for this online on our website. You can be a part of this where we're, we're developing opportunities for people to be in relationship, learning with each other and from each other, and breaking bread together. After watching George Floyd die while one police officer knelt on his neck, I wasn't able to see in the initial footage there were two more police officers behind him. Listening to him cry out that he couldn't breathe, 
and apparently somewhere in there crying out for his mother. And then watching him die on video, right? They say that he wasn't pronounced dead until he got to the hospital, but he looked like he had expired by the time they'd loaded him on the gurney. Like there's something inside of you that should say, that just can't be, that just can't be right. And I know what often happens for us is, is especially if you are someone who looks like me, you begin to say, well, I wonder what else happened that led them to do this for this person. You know what, it doesn't matter. Like, like I, I don't know that anything else happened. I suspect nothing else happened. Uh, all the video we see wasn't resisting arrest or anything else, but, but nobody deserves to die when being arrested. <laughs> like this is just not okay. And none of us would think it's okay if this was somebody in our family or somebody who was uh, someone that we knew. So we see this, and, and we're meant to feel something. We're meant to feel pain when we see this. And we recognize, you know, when we start to raise questions about this, then it may feel like, well, we're criticizing police. And, and of course, this is not about criticizing police. It's about saying there's something happened here that was wrong, and there were people who were responsible for this person, and instead, he died under their watch. Right? And we have to raise questions about that. It doesn't mean we don't... We spent two weeks you know, writing letters to the police department saying, hey, we, we are praying for you and, and sending meals and doing things to say, you know, we, we love you and we're so grateful for what you do. We have a number of police officers, law enforcement, who are a part of our congregation. I love these people. And they're awesome. They've committed their lives to trying to you know, protect us and, and keep us safe. And at the same time, sometimes bad decisions are made. And occasionally there are bad actors. And we have to talk about it. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to the Kansas City, Missouri Chief of Police, Rick Smith. Rick has been here in Kansas City for 32 years and uh, leads the largest police department in the Kansas City area. And Rick, if you'd come on up. Uh, I have asked him to come and to share with us a bit about his response and law enforcement's, law enforcement's response to what happened in Minneapolis. And Rick, I so appreciate you. You've been a friend of this congregation and this community, and uh, welcome to you. Thank you for being here with me today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So, so if you would just tell, tell our folks when you saw the footage uh, of what happened to George Floyd in Minneapolis, what was your response as the chief of police? Well, I heard it on the news like most people and I started watching the footage and I have to turn away because you know that's my profession that's highlighted uh, in front of the camera and when you see something like that it, it you know it hurts you to see what's happening um, someone in uniform doing something that magnitude to somebody else yeah what was your immediate thought for our, our community for Kansas City right it, so when I got that information and went back to work the next day and talked, we talked about it with training. We sat down with executive staff. We said, what are we doing right? How do we make sure this never happens here? We went through a whole training regiment. We actually tweaked some things to make sure on the possibility that something like this could not happen here, right? We put out bulletins that said, don't do this, do this. We put out a training tape that referenced the video in Minneapolis and then showed how we use proper techniques as a way to reinforce in our officers that we want them to use department approved techniques techniques and you won't get caught in this kind of situation. Yeah. Would you just say a word, you know, not all of us know what the mission is of the police department. What is your, what's your job? What's your calling? Well, I, I've always said it's to protect the citizens of Kansas City, right? We want people to be safe. We want people to be happy. We want people to live their lives in this city um, without violence, without intrusions of, of that sort of nature in everyone's life. And, and, and through that comes in many different ways. Um, I think we talk about, you know, the helping hand of the police department, social workers at stations, PAL, day youth camps, uh, the youth police initiative, all those kinds of things. But we also have the other side where when there are people out who are working hard to make neighborhoods less desirable and are terrifying people, that we have to engage in that activity also. As you think about people who might have a fear of police officers, I mean, that there are, there are a number of folks who whose, their experience in the past or what they've seen leads them to be a fearful of police officers. What, what would you say to them? Yeah, I, I, I think this is the, the big challenge for law enforcement, and we see it unfolding in America today. How do we get those people to see us differently? And, and I'm not saying there's a, an answer overnight, but I can tell you for the 32 years I've been in Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, we've been involved in the neighborhoods, we've been involved with people um, in their houses, in their yards, in their playgrounds, at their schools. And I think for people who are scared, I, I want them to see police officers in the ambassador helping role, not just the bad role. I think that 
people may see on TV or through the media. But every day, Adam, we're out there doing great things in this city, from helping someone change a tire to help reunite a kid and her mom who got separated. Those things never make the news. Yeah. But we are out there helping every day. We're 24-7, 365. When the snow is eight inches deep, we're out there. When the tornado goes through, we're there. There's no one more committed to being ready and to help people than the police department in your city. Chief, thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you. Thank you. You too, Adam. Thank Absolutely. you. I'm grateful for Chief Smith and his willingness to come and join us and to share a bit of what they're walking through. And, and there's a group of us clergy who are going to be meeting with the chiefs of police in the Kansas City area to really look at how do we continue to make sure that nothing like this is going to happen in our city or that we do everything we can to prevent something like this from happening in our city. I also spoke this week with one of our pastors, actually with several of our pastors, people of color, all three, but in particular, I wanted you to hear from Pastor Daryl Burton. Pastor Burton joined our team uh, seven years ago. He's the CEO and co-founder or founder of Miracle of Innocence. His uh, story is most remarkable, and many of you have heard his story before, but some of you are new and haven't. For 24 years, he was in prison for a murder he didn't con commit. A and there was a witness who could have testified at his trial that he didn't commit the murder, but she was kept from testifying. It's 24 years and several months before finally his, he received a second trial and was exonerated on the basis of that witness. And he promised when he was in prison that if he ever got out, if Jesus got him out, he would serve Jesus and tell people about Jesus the rest of his life. And when he, when he uh, was finally released from prison, he went to seminary and now is one of your pastors here at Church of the Resurrection. Pastor Darrell, thank you for being on our team and thank you for coming to share with us today. And what are you feeling when you see these things? It's heartbreaking to see something like that, and especially with this recent event uh, with George Floyd. Uh, I cried, I cried, I went, I prayed, and, uh, and but for the grace of God, that could have been me. And there's three things that, you know, in that situation that really just brought me, you know, to bawling. And one was he pleaded, of course, for his life, and he said, sir, and then he called for his mother, you know, you know, mama, and I just, you know, I, I lost it because, I mean, here was a man that was, you know, I mean, helpless, defenseless, and, you know, and for five, six, seven minutes, whatever it was, uh, I mean, I, I just couldn't picture, you know, someone just, you know, just suffocating a life or just taking a life from a man for really, for no reason. You mentioned in uh, seeing uh, Ahmed Arbery, and he's jogging on a Sunday afternoon, and, uh, and you know, in essence, a lynching. What... What were you feeling when you saw that video? You, you jogged yourself. Well, today when I was jogging, I came across a man, he had a dog, and, uh, and I crossed on the other side because I didn't want him to have uh, thoughts or feel afraid or feel that I was a threat to him because here's a guy running and maybe may feel I'm running up on him or something. And then a woman also, uh, she was out walking and I crossed on the other side just to jog past him just so it would be clear, you know, that I am no threat, that I pose no threat uh, to them and what, uh, one way whatsoever. So when I saw that with our, uh, Adman Arbery, you know, it was just, uh, it was really just another one of those situations where, you know, I've seen this so many times. So this was not something I haven't seen. It's new for those who have video cameras and are seeing it right now. But I, I've seen this from the time I was a kid. And, and I know sometimes when, even when police come after young men who are men of color and they say, why don't they stop and don't run? Well, we run because we're afraid, because we've been conditioned, we've been taught as kids you know, when the police come after you, they're going to hurt you. They run, you know, because we want to live. What would you tell us to break, break down the barrier? How does, it, how does it get broken down from your perspective? You know, and I, I love this community. I, I know, and we feel a love. Valerie and I and our family, you know, we know we're exactly what we need to be with resurrection. You know, as it relates to, you know, breaking down barriers or at least trying to, you know, get past the racial, you know, um, like divisions, I think if we continue to talk and have dialogue and continue to be a part, you know, of this, you know, this issue, this problem, and in particular with white people, because what I've learned, at least from my historical understanding, is that when slavery stopped, it's when white people got fed of it, even though it was, a, you know, a war as a result of it. But, you know, as it relates to, you know, civil rights, you know, with voting rights, you know, with the rights, uh, Jim Crow, when a lot of these things, when they ended, it's because when white people said, look, that's enough, enough is enough, and joined forces with Dr. King and others, to say we need to do something, you know, to correct this, you know, to right this wrong. And I think if we can continue to do that and be intentional and not a one-off, but continue to do these things, I think it can make a difference. Well, that's really the aim today. This is what we're really aiming for is to be able to say, you know, we together can do something that can change our city and change our world. And this isn't a one-off. This is really for 26 years. This has been 29 years now, 
been a part of the vision of the church. Pastor Darrell, thank you so much for joining me in the sermon today. I so appreciate everything that you do, who you are, and I'm grateful for your friendship yeah. and your role in my life. Blessings you. to you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, I also appreciated his words that civil rights have only changed when the, the dominant or the privileged class of people decided enough is enough and got involved. Right? The, the people who are being oppressed have a hard time changing things without the help of the people who have power. And so this leads me to our scripture passage for the day. This is Pentecost weekend. And on Pentecost weekend, we remember the power of the Holy Spirit that was, uh, was given to those earliest disciples. Jesus had promised that after he had died and was raised from the dead and ascended to heaven, that he would give the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would come and empower God's people. He would give them power to be his witnesses. He would guide them into all truth. He would transform their lives. He would, he would convict them of sin. All of these things are the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be preaching on the Holy Spirit this fall, a whole series of sermons about the work of the Holy Spirit. But on the day of Pentecost, we remember that 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit fell upon those disciples as they were gathered in the upper room. There was 120 of them, Scripture says, in the book of Acts. And the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began to speak in other languages they had never known before. They were filled with power. It was like a rushing, violent wind that filled the room and power coming upon them, flames of fire in the room, and they spilled out into the streets, and they began to teach and to speak and to bear witness to their faith in languages they had never known before. So the people from around the world who were in Jerusalem for this festival were able to hear the good news in their own languages. The Holy Spirit unified people, brought people together, empowered people to have courage to be witnesses for Christ. And what I want to suggest is usually we read that passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 2 as though this is really about the Holy Spirit giving us power so that we can tell other people about Jesus. And of course, that is true. We are to be his witnesses when it comes to talking about Jesus and our faith in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit empowers us to do that. But being his witnesses is not just about telling other people that Jesus is and, and about our relationship with Jesus. It's also about the values that Jesus espoused. It's also about the kingdom that he taught about. And so we're meant to be his witnesses about those things too. And often we find it's frightening to be as witnesses. It's frightening to speak up. It's just so much easier to be quiet when, when things are happening that, that aren't quite right and, it's just, and other people are, you know, are somehow not speaking against it and, and it feels hard for us to say, this is just not right. And so we just are quiet and quietly inside. Maybe we pray, maybe we feel like we, you know, this is not right, but, but we don't do anything about it. And the Holy Spirit was meant to give us power to be God's witnesses when things are wrong and somebody needs to speak up. I'm reminded of the words of Proverbs chapter 31, verses 8 and 9, where we read these words. Speak out on behalf of the voiceless and for the rights of all who are vulnerable. Speak out in order to judge with righteousness and to defend the needy and the poor. Now, we hear those words that we're to speak up for those who can't speak up for themselves, but we find it so hard to do that. We find it, it, it frightening to speak up sometimes for other people. It takes courage to do this, which is why... I think the power of the Holy Spirit was not just about us telling other people about Jesus and inviting them to church. It was also the courage to be able to say when your friends are making fun of somebody, hey, you know what? I love you guys, but that's not okay. Or, or, or when uh, generalizations are being made or biases are being portrayed about other people, when you say, you know what? That's not my experience. And you know, it only takes one person in a group of people when, when everybody's sort of confirming each other's biases, whether it's politics or religion or, or race or whatever it might be, when everybody's, you know, most people are quiet and several people are speaking their mind about whatever it is, it only takes one person to say, hey, you know what, I really, I care about you. That is not my experience. Or I think that's harmful. Or if somebody from that group were sitting here with us, would we say those things? You know, this is just not okay. I don't think it reflects the love of Christ. I don't think it reflects how we're meant to live our lives. It's just so much easier to keep your head down low and not say that. But the power of the Holy Spirit, when it comes upon you, is meant to give you the courage to be able to speak those kinds of words as well, which is what we need to be able to do. I'm gonna to suggest to you that if today on, on Pentecost weekend, we're inviting the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us and we're praying, give me the courage to speak when I need to speak, that God's Spirit might actually do that for us if we're seeking it. I was reading uh, this week about a middle-aged white woman. <clears throat> She's about my age, I think, maybe a little younger. And uh, she was sitting in a Starbucks. This was in 2018. She was sitting in a Starbucks in an upper-middle-income community, lots of master's degrees and doctor's degrees. 72%, this is in the Northeast, and 72% of the people were white and, and, and then a mixture of other races that were in this community. She was sitting there, and she noticed something was you know, kind of strange. There were a couple of African-American who, men who walked into the Starbucks, and they wanted to know where the bathroom was. And the barista said, well, the bathroom's only for people who buy things. And they weren't buying anything. And so they sat down. And nobody knew that there was a white friend who was meeting them at that Starbucks a little bit later, a few minutes later. 
a few too many minutes later because the barista was scared of these two white men who were sitting, or these two black men who were sitting there who, who hadn't ordered anything, and she called the police. And now this white middle-aged woman is watching this, and there's a younger African-American woman who's got her cell phone out, and she or someone else sitting near her begins recording what's happening. And, and she watches as the two police come in, and they go to escort these young African-Americans out, and, and they say, what did we do? Why are we, why are we being asked to leave? Well, there was no answer. And, and, and when they refused to leave, there were two more police officers who showed up, and then two more police officers who showed up. Now, the police are just doing their job. They're coming because they've got a complaint from a barista, but they haven't stopped to ask the question, should we be escorting these people out? So all of this is filmed on video from the young African-American woman who's watched the entire thing, and the white woman is sitting there, and she's got her head down. She's just sitting head down, not saying anything. And then she begins to talk with the young woman, the African-American woman, and as they're talking, she's realizing, you know, I'm seeing something that I've never seen before with my own eyes in this place where I come, and this just isn't right. And, and the woman who was recording on her phone wasn't you know, sure she should post it online. And so the white woman said, well, I can post it online. Here's what she said, her, her reflection. She said, to be perfectly honest, I never spoke up that day. I'm just some regular person. I, I really don't know what compelled me to stand up and join in with Michelle, the young African-American woman, that day. But all I know is that I saw something in a different way than I had ever seen before in that moment. I felt angry for them. I felt ashamed that, was, that this was happening to them. I saw it through a different lens than I had ever seen any situation in my life, and I knew intuitively that these things happened, but I never had seen it, never had it happen to me before in a way that I could actually see it. And so Melissa posted the video online, and something like eight million views later, you know, she and Michelle hear that the CEO of Starbucks has apologized for what happened. And 8,000 Starbucks shut down for four hours one day, and 175,000 employees at Starbucks receive mandatory unconscious bias training. The largest coffee chain in the world changed their practices because two women spoke up. Right? That is the power of speaking. Here's a picture of Michelle and Melissa. Melissa on the left, Michelle on the right. And after this, they'd never met before, but after this, they started an organization called From Privilege to Progress, to address racism in its various forms around the world. So that's what can happen when somebody speaks up, when they see something that's wrong and they actually say, hey, you know what, that's not okay. Why are you doing this? This is not okay. I wonder what would have happened if a neighbor had seen what was going down or maybe overheard what was about to happen as this young black man was jogging through the neighborhood in Georgia and said to the men with their guns, hey, you know what, that's not okay. It's not okay, don't do that. I wonder what would have happened if one of the four police officers who arrested George Floyd had pushed the guy off his neck and said, dude, that is not okay. That is not, that's not what we do. That's not who we are. Get off his neck, let him breathe. There were four police officers. If one of them had had the courage to push the guy off his neck, but that didn't happen. Several years after attacks on various synagogues across the country, we hosted an event here. 1,500 people showed up to show our solidarity with the Jewish community. And, and as we were doing that, we were listening, we were learning, we were trying to understand about white nationalism and hate and hate speech that was happening and what was happening to our Jewish friends. And we wanted to say to those in the Jewish community around us, we are with you and you are not alone. And if something happens to you, you talk to us because we're gonna be with you, we're gonna stand with you. Same thing happened when, when there were Muslim communities that were being attacked and things written on their signs. And, and you know, I contacted their imams and I said, hey, we are with you and our church is with you, we stand with you. And, 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 and this week, you know, speaking with some of the African-American pastors in our community and saying, look, you know, we've seen this too. Let's do something together. Let's stand together. And one of the things we said at that time was, we are going to do three things. We are going to speak up, we're gonna stand with each other, and we're gonna demonstrate love to our neighbors like we love ourselves. That leads me to one last story. Some of you who are regulars at Church of the Resurrection have heard this, but many of you have just recently started joining us. So a friend of mine is Rabbi Art Nemetov. Uh, he is senior rabbi at Congregation B'nai Yehuda, not, a, not very far from this congregation. And uh, one morning we went to lunch. He said, Adam, you know, I've been listening to what's happening. There were some things, there were comments that were being made at one of the Blue Valley High Schools about uh, Jewish people. And he said, you know, they, were, they, they thought it was funny and there were people who were doing a Heil Hitler to the, you know, at, at, to the opposing team because there were Jews in that school and, and, and they thought it was really funny. And, and he said, hey, you know, 
I need your help because, you know, this isn't okay. And, and this is what it feels like as a Jew to have this happen, you know, to our kids at a high school basketball game. And it's not okay. And I was so glad he came to me. And I'm, I, you know, I hadn't heard about it. And I was glad to hear about it and said, no, we're going to stand together on this. And we're going to stand against this. And, you know, we talked about it in church that Sunday and, and you know, asking our people to, to, you know, take a stand. Anyway, while we were sitting there at lunch, he said, uh, I want to tell you a story about my life. I've, I've hardly told anybody about this. And since then, he shared this with his congregation, with others. But I was really honored that he shared this with me. He grew up in Kansas City. Uh, he, he grew up, he was a, he was a small kid for, uh, for his age. And uh, he was in high school when his father died. He was going to gym class. They were meeting in the, in the uh, swimming pool that day, having gym class. And when his dad died, you know, he, he was out of school for several days. And when he came back, he, he had, in the Jewish community, there's a piece of torn fabric that you wear over your heart. It's a reminder that there's been a tear in your life at the death of somebody who just lost his dad. And he'd been wearing this around all day at school. And, and here he is in gym and, and you know, it's a, at the swimming pool. And there's these kids who come up to him, these older, bigger kids come up to him. And, and they say, you know, why are you wearing that stupid torn fabric over your heart right now? You're not just stupid. And he tries to explain to them, you know, my dad died, and this is the way we recognize that. And they just keep picking at him and picking on him and, and, and teasing him. And, and then there's this kid who gets out of the pool and walks over. He's bigger than those two or three other kids who were standing there. And, and he says, listen, if you're going to pick on him, you've got to pick on me. And Art starts tearing up as he's telling me the story. You know, he says, to have somebody who was bigger than me, you know, I didn't know him, but he stood up for me. He stood with me. And that made all the difference in the world. In that moment, he stood up for me. And you know what he was trying to do by telling me that story was he's inviting me to stand with his community, right? To speak up for those who cannot always speak up for themselves or at least not be heard. And when I think about that story, I share that story with our confirmation classes regularly around here because I say to them, you know what? You confirmands, my hope and prayer is if you're a real Christian, you're going to be the kind of person who speaks up for those who can't speak up for themselves. You're going to be the kind of person who stands with people who are being bullied or picked on. You're going to be the kind of person who loves your neighbor as you love yourself, even if your neighbor is completely different from you, a different faith, a different background, a different color skin. You're going to love your neighbors, you love yourself. This is what it means to be a Christian. We follow Jesus, and Jesus called us to love our neighbors, and we're going to love our neighbors and speak up and stand with them. And that's my hope and prayer with you. By the way, here's a picture of Rabbi Art and I when we were in the Holy Land. We've traveled, you know, the Holy Land. We have preached sermons together. I love this man like my own brother. And I'm going to stand with him. I'm going to speak up for him. And I'm going to love him as I love myself. So there's 30,000 of you, maybe more, who are watching this sermon right now. And here's what I'm going to ask you. Are you going to allow the Holy Spirit to give you courage to guide you into all truth? Are you going to be people who give in to the ugly biases that we were raised with or the, or the, or the conspiracy theories that people spout all around us or, 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 the, or the tendency to see people in the worst possible way instead of the, the best possible way? Are you going to give in to keeping your head down and not speaking up and being cowardly? Or are you going to be courageous in speaking up for those who can't speak up for themselves? And my hope is, I mean, there's 30,000, last week of 35,000 people, that's about as many people as go to a baseball game at Royal Stadium in Kansas City. Like I'm thinking if there's 35,000 people hearing this message, we ought to be able to make a dent in our city. We ought to be able to be 35,000 people who are champions of love, who are courageous Christians, who are standing with our neighbors, who are speaking up when we see something evil or harmful, harmful or hurtful happening, and who are demonstrating love to all that we meet. So I want to ask you to make this commitment today. I want to ask you to say to yourself and to Jesus, I will not speak ill of other people. I, I will not practice gossip I will not share hearsay, and I'm not going to speak ill of other people. That's the first thing. The second is I'm going to assume the best of other people until I have no possibility of not doing that anymore. I'm going to assume the best of other people, not the worst. I will speak up when other people are harmed or threatened or bullied or picked on. I will stand with those who need me, and I will love my neighbors. I love myself. I hope you'll make that commitment today. And that we together can be a force for Christ in pushing back the darkness of our world and bringing his light and love to all that we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, you see these acts of racism, prejudice, bigotry, bias. You see these crimes that are committed against people. 
because of these biases. You, you know, O oh Lord, how easy it is for us to make excuses for being silent and not speaking up. You know how hard it is, O oh God, for us to speak up when all of our friends or neighbors seem to hold a different view than ours. Oh Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for the unconscious biases in our hearts. Forgive us for elevating ourselves and thinking less of other people. Forgive us, oh Lord, for making excuses for the evil that we see in the world around us. Forgive us for our silence. We offer our lives to you. Would you put your hands on your lap like, like while you're praying right now, just with your palms uplifted, like you're a cup, like you're open to being filled. And I want to invite you just to whisper this prayer right now. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me with your power. Fill me with courage. Fill me with love. Fill me with holy boldness. And use me, I pray, that our world look, might look more like your kingdom. Use me in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again online or live in worship. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, please visit core.org. Have a great week.